that so we should have everything. Let's just make sure that the sound works. Yeah, it seems to work. Good. So today I'm going to start with the first assignment. Um, you can get to it from the course page, which I just uh, posted. Uh, now we have assignment number one, projection matrix, uh, magic, magic projection. And the idea for this assignment is um, <coughs> based on a magic trick that I saw um, in America's Got Talent. So let's watch it first. Hello! So what do you think? So I think that's a pretty amazing magic trick. Uh, the judges also went crazy. Like this is one of the shows where they have to, and the audience liked it obviously.
So how do you think it was done? How did he do the method? So I think that part may have still been slide of hand. But now it goes completely crazy. And then he snaps his fingers and the four points move. So any ideas? So I think, <clears throat> and I could be completely wrong of course, but I don't think you can snap your fingers and then the four points appear with sleight of hand, right? So I think uh, the way it's done is in his setup, he has a projector, an LCD projector, so he can project similar to this, right? So he can project from the um, bottom, or the top, uh, he can project the coins onto the playing field. So, because you're not actually there, you're far enough away that if you have a picture of the coin there, then that will be close enough for you to think that there is a coin. And of course, the, the first part, I think, is just to convince you that there are actually four coins rather than. Um, projections of coins. So then there's another magic trick similar to this.
Now we're just pushing it across each individual from the uh, white to a black thing. But this even had a nice story to go with it. And the crowd goes wild. So for those two tricks, I think the setup is pretty similar. And uh, 
I'm not a magician, so I have no idea how this was done. But uh, my view is that certainly the big changes um, could be done with a projection. And that's what we want to investigate with uh, the first assignment. We want to see how well that would work, except um, so you're trying to implement a similar magic trick, um, a little bit simplified as uh, those two magicians. So I think the setup is something like that. We have a LCD projector, a camera looking over the field, or maybe you want to swap those two so that the camera looks at the magician and the projector is on the side. <coughs> and then there's different things that you can project. Um, I thought about one would be coins, like the uh, first magician will, and cards. Uh, that's what mostly the second guy did, Eric. And then I thought uh, we can also try dice, like uh, rolling a dice, and then you can uh, predict what number will come up. Right? You just roll the dice, and then you you say three. Then the projector is going to project a three on top of the dice. If you can uh, position it accurately enough, then people will see a three. So you have a a, a fake dice that doesn't have any numbers on it. Uh, made out of paper, then you can roll the dice. That's one way of doing it. The other one would be uh, to use uh, projection only, use computer vision only. But then I think it would be hard to match the rolling of the dice with your hand movements. Like you would have to then train to make it look the same always. So your hand moves, then the dice starts rolling, and it stops, and then you project the three or five or whatever the person said should come up. So that's a basic setup. The idea it's a close-in magic, so that's why you have a little bit of an advantage, because it's done with cameras at fixed viewpoints. And the general audience would be too far away to see the details. Like the people in the audience could only see what's happening on the screen. They can't see the small table, what's going on in front of the small table. So first thing that we want to try is to disappear the coins. And that means you want to set up your camera, look at your area, your playing field in front of you. And then you want to be able to move your hand. And based on certain signals, you want the coin to appear in the image at that point. Okay. So that means you need to track the hand, look for differences in the hand position, and then you, because your projector would have to sort of make the coins disappear on a snap or something. So that's what you want to uh, pick up on. Uh, second one would be the playing cards. Now, uh, the playing cards you want to be able to manipulate naturally most of the time. So, um, probably what I would use would be just a white card out, cutout that looks like a cardboard cutout that looks like, like a playing card, but it's white on both sides, which would allow you to project whatever you, uh, image you want on top of it. So, you can make it. Uh, any card you want or any uh, deck face card that you want. And of course, if you project the playing surface, you can make the card uh, 
be a good, so physical card. And then last, tracking the dice, um, roll the dice, what you go through the image, immediately after it stops, project the three or two or one or whatever you want on top of the dice in order to give the magician the power to predict what the next uh, roll of the die is going to be. So there are three different versions that uh, you can think about that you would want to implement. Using OpenCV. In order to implement them, part of it will be to extract the position of the card, the dice or the coins, and of course you can do that uh, using edge detection, so today we'll talk some about edge detection. I also think you need to track the magician's hands for movement, and that you can do using background subtraction, which means you take a picture of the playing field and you look and analyze changes in it. And when you do the magic trick, I think, um, that's why I think it's better if the camera is in front, because then the hands will just move here in this area, and, not, and the top part you can use for your projection. It will be difficult to project. You have to be careful if your projector is overhead, and you move your hand, and you project a coin, then the coin would appear on your hand all of a sudden. Because, and you'll cast a shadow. So that will be a little bit too obvious. So that's why you want the hands outside of the uh, projection. Yeah, so we're gonna have some fun with magic and computer vision now. <laughs> Since most of you don't have a projector available uh, readily, that means that we'll only focus on the computer vision part, which means uh, you'll be projecting it onto the uh, video stream that you pass out. So that means uh, you could do the magic trick in a virtual setting, but not in a physical one. Right? So. Uh, you could implement the program, uh, record, uh, process the video, and then generate the video going out with your magic tricks and your coins appearing and disappearing. Right? So that makes it <coughs> a lot easier. It's also not something that magicians really like to do. Uh, it's, uh, according to my colleague, it's a taboo, but um, we're not doing this for the magic show, we're only doing this to learn about computer vision and uh, applications of computer vision in a fun way. So um, I think it's okay. The, the, the leaders of the magic societies are not going to dance. And that's what it would look like in the video, but not on the physical table. You would need a projector to do it on a physical table like that. And with the projector, of course, the problem is you have to worry about your hand. So that's why I think uh, in this case they may have, uh, if they did use a projector, which is not clear, um, but if they did, then 
uh, the projector is probably underneath projecting from the bottom rather than the top. In that case, you would need to worry about the shadows. Okay, so that's the assignment, and the deadline is uh, 25th, so three weeks from now. So today, um, let me just close of this. So your setup should be something like this with the camera, but you can ignore the LCD projector for the first assignment. <coughs> and then maybe we'll do it in the second assignment. Now, Today we'll do talk about convolution and edge detection. So we start out with an image by from a very famous movie, Casablanca, Blanca, with Humphrey Bogart, and the girl's name. So, now one of the most versatile and um, most versatile and uh, also extremely efficient algorithms for doing computer vision uh, is the convolution. <coughs> now, convolution is simply calculating the, calculating the weighted sum given a weight matrix of uh, a pixel and its neighbors, multiply that by the weight matrix and then apply it to the pixel. So when we define a convolution, we provide a matrix, we provide the weight matrix, which is the, the matrix, and then say uh, what the values are for the individual uh, pixels. Uh, as we want to multiply them. 
Now, since the convolution matrix is going to replace the center pixel, and we'll see an example of that in a second, uh, usually <coughs> these matrices are odd, so they have an odd number of rows, odd, odd number of columns, um, Three, five, seven, nine, uh, eleven, as opposed to even ones. And the reason for that is simply that if you have an even number of rows or columns, then you don't know which one is actually the center. Like if I have a three by three matrix. Then the pixel that I'm going to be processing, the center pixel is clearly defined, it's this one, right? And if it's five by five, then it's also, there's a clear center pixel. The problem is if I have a two by two, then the center of that matrix would be there, so it's not clear what pixel that belongs to, that actual center. So that's why the uh, matrices are always odd. And we also have a problem at uh, the boundaries of our image. If I haven't uh, 3x3 three three convolution kernel, and this is my image. Then I can have some weights here. Say, for some reason, I want 1, 2, 3, minus 1, 2, minus 2, minus 3, 4, 5, 6. That will be a convolution. Um, kernel, convolution matrix, and that means that as I apply it to my image, I will calculate plus one time my um, top left neighbor, plus two times my top neighbor, plus three times top right neighbor, minus one time my left neighbor, minus two times myself, minus three times my right neighbor, plus four times the bottom left, plus five times the bottom, plus six times the bottom right. That will be applying the convolution mask. Then, uh, whatever pixel values I have here, if this is uh, the pixel on my top left, if that one has brightness 100, then it will be 100, here, 1 times 100. And if the, bot, the top neighbor has 10, then it will be plus 2 times 10, and so on and so forth. That's how they, what we will calculate. Now we have a problem in practice because if I do that, on the, if I apply that for the first pixel, the top left, then my top left neighbor doesn't really exist, right? These pixels don't exist, they're outside of the bounds of the image. So we have to figure out what to do at the border. And there's different ways uh, to do that. Um, one is to pad the image. Actually, I guess there's uh, yeah, multiple ways to do it. One would be to pad the image, which means you simply add ones as many as you need, depending on the size of your kernel. So you just keep virtually expanding 
the size of your uh, image. That works. That basically means you hold the value steady for as many neighbors as you want there. That's a very uh, common way to overcome that problem at the borders. The other ones would be replacing it with zeros, right? So instead of having these numbers here, I just say the boundary is all zeros. Um, you can do that. Or you can also wrap it around. So you can say the left neighbor of here is the pixel all the way over on the other side. Right. Now wrap around uh, doesn't doesn't really make sense except you have sort of pictures that are really supposed to wrap around. If you have a 360 degree scan of the environment, um, like some high resolution cameras that you have, uh, they are actually, or uh, if this is a lighter scan kind of thing, you can also apply uh, convolution of the images that you get, or you have multiple cameras and you merge the views together, then it will make sense to, to stitch them together or wrap them around. But um, if it's a single view, then usually you either pad or reset it with zero. Where padding is probably the most uh, common one. And another choice that we do have is um, you could also discard those pixels. So you say, if there's no left neighbor, if it doesn't exist, then I simply throw away the, these values here. But <coughs> that's not very nice. I usually don't like to do that because then your image will be 640 by 480. But if you have a 5 by 5 convolution kernel, that means that you miss two rows and two columns at the top, two rows and two columns at the bottom. So then your output image will be six, uh, 36 by 476. You lose rows and columns, right? And that in itself wouldn't be such a big deal. You lose a couple of pixels on the edge of your image. But the problem is then you always have to add four if you go from edge image to real image. So that makes it mm, cumbersome, not so nice, right? Because now zero, zero in your image is the top left, but zero, zero in your edge image will correspond to pixel two, two in the original image. So then you have to add the, this, these pixels that you discarded to the rows and the columns. And um, it's much easier, it's easy enough to get the coordinates uh, confused. So it's uh, better to just keep the coordinates the same. So that X and Y corresponds to the same pixel in the original image and your edge map or your edge image. So here I have a convolution mask now, five by five mask. So what does that mask actually do?
Well, the center of the mass is here. That's my center pixel. That pixel will get a new value. That value is zero times the top, top left neighbor. Right? Zero times this pixel, plus zero, plus zero, plus zero, plus zero. So all of these pixels don't matter, they're all ignored. The only one that matters is this one here. So this pixel value will be replaced by one time that pixel's value. And the end effect uh, of that will be that for the entire image, every pixel will be replaced by its bottom left neighbor. So um, what would be the effect of that? Yep. It'll be a shift, right? And shift in which direction? Top right. Top right. Uh, yes, so the whole picture should be shifted to the top right. So let's try that out. Now, to do convolution in SciPy, SciPy has a signal module that I import as SS, SciPy signal, and then it has a convolve function which is very convenient to use. You can pass in an image, the convolution mask, and then if you want padding or wraparound or zero extension or other kinds of extensions, uh, you could do that. <coughs> now I apply that image here is one time the convolution mask. And here I apply the same convolution 20 times, just to see a little bit, because the shift by one pixel is a little bit hard to see. And then we can show the output. And now what shift do we have? So that image compared to this image, how has this image shifted? That's actually opposite of what we expected, right? The image was supposed to be shifted up towards the right, like this, but in fact it shifted downwards here. And the reason for that is because the, our analysis is actually correct. It should be shifted to the top right. But the problem is that there's two different um, branches of engineering that use convolution. And they have slightly different interpretations of it. So the uh, computer vision version of convolution would be exactly this. So if I have a minus one, then it should be shifted to the top right. And the signal processing people, they think of it slightly different. They think like the mask is going across and for every pixel, we calculate how much weight of that pixel is added to this particular pixel. So that means they think that pixel will be completely added to here, which is how they get the shift to the um, bottom left. Now, the, uh, the interpretations 
are in a sense equivalent. You just need to rotate your mass by 180 degrees, then you get exactly the same uh, result. But you have to be careful when you actually use convolution algorithms to see which interpretation they follow. If the uh, algorithm was implemented by signal processing engineers, then usually they, it will be 180 degrees from what you think it should be. And um, then there's this whole uh, sort of argument uh, that in signal processing, they are not really calculating convolution, they're calculating correlation and, and things like that. Uh, now, most masks are in fact symmetrical, so in that case, you wouldn't notice any difference, right? If you have a mask like this, one, two, uh, 0 0.5, 0, 2, 1, then uh, I can flip this by 180 degrees without uh, changing anything. And then the two implementations will be, will give you the same result independently of how you think about it. But with uh, convolution implemented as using the sci-fi library, the signal library, uh, you have to be careful. If the, your kernel is not symmetrical, then you will end up with a result that is different from what you would expect. <coughs> so here, this is just showing it. Uh, we take the numbers from 1 to 25 and reshape them. Then I have an array here and I calculate the convolution. Now that, in computer vision, that should shift the picture up. But when you look at it, and it'll actually shift it down. Like this picture here, one is in the first row, row one. Here it's in row two. And the same thing left and right. So if you want to shift uh, right, then this would be using sci-fi, you would have to use a mask uh, or shift on right. So, now this simple operation, this convolution, is very powerful in the sense that uh, there's many different things we can do to the image, many different image operations that we can apply uh, that can be implemented using a convolution matrix and the, those run uh, usually very quickly. They're also highly parallelizable, which means that if you implement them on a GPU, uh, they're easy to be implemented on a GPU. And uh, also in modern AI, uh, deep learning, 
uh, the uh, CNNs, the convolutional neural networks, are basically doing a very similar function to this. So, and that's usually the first layer that you have in a computer vision uh, network. So one of the things that we can do with our template matching, um, uh, with our convolution mask is we can easily find certain objects, certain uh, simple patterns in the image. So we can find a template image in a larger part of the image. <coughs> And that um, can be quite useful, um, for example. And the, the way to do that is you simply extract the part of the image that you want as a convolution mask. Then you run it over the image. And the maximum response is the one that where you actually, where that feature occurs. So, Letter A, for example, in a document that you take with uh, not with very little distortion, no changes in brightness. If you need to look for a certain pattern, you can just cut out the A and then run a convolution mask over the image. It will give you all the A's in your document. Or uh, other patterns that you, you may want to look for. So here I implemented it So here's our input image and I thresholded it uh, to get a binary image and then I cut out that little part here And this will be the template. Then if I run, this will be the output of my convolution mask with this weight matrix over the entire image. And you can see we get the strongest response in this area here, which is actually where that, that shape occurred in the original image. Now,
Now, another more interesting version of template matching is in the cross correlation. And I said uh, before, basically convolution and correlation are the same thing, except the, the sign is different. Um, but one is more usually used in signal processing, the other one in computer vision. Um, so these slides were actually using the correlation idea, but it will be what we call template matching in computer vision. So this is based on a game uh, that is quite popular. Uh, it's called Where is Waldo? And then Waldo is this. I don't know if you have this in Taiwan. You play the same game. This guy with the striped shirt, and then you have images like this. And you're supposed to find Waldo, which requires some search visually I cannot actually see him now where is he I don't think he's in there oh here he's there Right, so now we found Waldo. In Germany, he's called Walda. So here is our image, and it's zoomed in, so it's extremely difficult. It's a pretty big image, it's very difficult to find the images, right? Um, but if you extract the template, you know what the shape looks like, you can actually look for Baldo uh, in that image. Now, when we usually introduce the convolution matrices, then in this case we have them one dimensional, right? So they would only apply to grayscale images. You calculate one output value for your convolution mask. If you do it with color images, then the same principle applies, except that you then need to have three. Mask. Either you apply the same three masks on each, on the red, the green, and the blue channel separately. That's a, a common approach. Um, and in theory, 
you could also have different masks for the different color channels, but uh, that's usually not done. Uh, in template matching, of course, we have three different masks, right? I have one red component, green component, blue component um, that are applied to the image. And then once you have the template, This is just a straightforward convolution then. So here's the entire image. Here is our mask. It's not just bigger. I seem to remember that he's here. Anyway, um, so the actual implementation then, you can do this convolution uh, using uh, NumPy arrays entirely if you uh, don't want to use the convolve to be. So we take our input image, we normalize them. So that they're between zero and uh, between minus one and one. And then we can multiply using numpy.multiply uh, with our mask and to the image. So the mask that we have is Wally, and this is the part of the image that we multiply together, then sum it up, and this will be the output of our convolution operator or cross correlation operator. Okay. Same thing. So then I take, apply that over the entire image. Then I find the maximum argument position. So where in my image do I get the maximum response? And then I convert that back to an index so that um, based on rows or columns, and then I have the coordinate of Wally. Then I can um, normalize the cross correlation results just to show them on the screen. And then we see the, the maximum output is somewhere here. But this will be how well background matches the volume figure, the tiny volume templates. So here's our maximum response. And then I just draw the rectangle around it. So that it will be. Oh, I didn't draw them there.
Now we found Gloria. So there he is. Then we can write a function that does that for us. I like find any kind of template. And then we can also run some tests to see if we add noise to the image, how robust is it? And I guess because it depends on actually quite a few pixels, it is not uh, too bad. So I distorted the image with white noise. So mean of zero, uh, normally distributed, uh, with a variance of one and two. And then let's see where we find the maximum. And it still works even if the image is corrupted by noise. Because there's many different pixels that all have to match uh, the same. Now we still find the same position. Now this was also I used the same template matching idea um, last year when we did the magic trick for our robot, one of the magic tricks. And what we wanted to do was to have somebody use psychokinesis which is the power to move objects with your mind. So you have the pen, and then I go like, and then the pen will move, right? Without touching it. So that's psychokinesis. We wanted to demonstrate that by our robot. So the idea was that the robot would do uh, psychokinesis. And, uh, or actually, no, this was for... Uh, something else without the rope, but <coughs> so we just used the camera. Now that trick, depending on what object you have, uh, now it's not very impressive, right? Because how do we move the thing? Why does the thing roll? So it's pretty clear that the only reason this moves is not psychokinesis, but the fact that we're moving the table. Right? That's why the jar moves. If I lift up the right side, it's going to roll to the left. So if you look at the video like this, it's not very impressive. Um, the, and usually you don't use your hand, you use the knees. Like, um, you, can, you can do this trick as a magician on the stage if it's a black table in front of a black background and you move it with your knees, that actually works. That small shift 
people are not going to notice in a, on a stage because they're too far away. But um, like this, of course, you would notice it. So the, what we did was I actually did a template match on the left and the edge, the right edge of the table. And so we match the template. So I find the right and the left edge of the table, that corner here, these two corners. And then before we send out the video, so now the table moves like this, right? Before I send out the video, I make sure that the table is straight. So I rotate the image to make sure that the table is always exactly horizontal. So then that just makes the magician move a little bit, rotate left and right as well, but that's okay. That actually looks pretty natural. Um, most people won't uh, pay attention to that. Then you have a flat table, and then, yeah, you're really going to town on psychokinesis. <laughs> <clears throat> now, you may think this is funny, but actually last week I got a review request for a, a scientific journal. And yeah, I don't have it here. Let me just see if they have it online. Uh, no, they don't have. Oh yeah, this is actually on research. Yeah, so this is this is a paper that they asked me to review. No, 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 this one. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, this one. So they actually have a paper where they say, basically, that they have humans that can do this, like no, no magicians. They actually claim they can do this, like, and then the mouse moves, right? Uh, they claim they have those, and they want me to review this because they want to know if robots can do the same. I think, and um, it's uh, the craziest paper I ever was asked to review. And I've had other ones that were pretty crazy, but this one is far out there. Um, unfortunately, they don't have the PDF because in their PDF on the Okay, this is different, but I'm sure it's the same guys, but on my paper, on the one that I was supposed to review, maybe this is a new version or something. Yeah, this is, I think they wrote more than one. Um, the paper that I was supposed to review had Wonder Woman uh, instead of the abstract, like there's a picture of Wonder Woman, which is not something you usually see in a scientific publication. <coughs> so here we use template matching as this was the easiest way to, um, 
to make the table flat in the video, right? To make sure that the table always stays flat. Ten foot matching worked really well there, extremely quickly. Uh, we tried some other approaches. Like background subtraction, uh, looking for optical flow, looking for changes, but all of that um, was not as efficient and accurate as the simple template matching algorithm. So we, we tried some much more complicated algorithms, but this simple one actually worked really well. So here's template matching with the Humphrey Bogart image, and you can find different, different features that way. Now, other matrices are <coughs> also uh, useful. So how about this one? Uh, Minus one, minus one, five, minus one, minus one. What do you think uh, will happen to the image if we apply that convolution mask? Like here. If I take that one. in the center, right? I multiply that by 5, so I give it a weight of 5. And then I subtract my four neighbors from it. So what that will do is it will take the difference between myself if, if the area here is uniform, right, that means all pixels have the same value, then that be 5 times myself plus minus 1 minus 1 minus 1, which means I simply increase the brightness at that point. By 20%. If there are differences in the image, like black to white, then I will stretch them out. So this particular filter allows us to increase the contrast in the image. Pixels that are close together will uh, be changed little, but pixels that are far apart, where there is a big difference, they will be... Um, that difference will be enhanced, will be increased. Now, if you increase the difference between the pixels, then you get sharper, stronger, bigger edges. And another one that is uh, quite common, what happens with this particular filter? If I have ones everywhere. Now, in this case, I have to rescale the image, first of all, right? Because if when one pixel here is 255, and I add all of them together, I end up with a number that is much larger than 255. So that means at the end, I want to take this, um, this, this ways to do that with just the convolution mask. I could use... 1 over 25, 1 over 25, 1 over 25 there, uh, which would work. Or I can use a mask of 1, 1, 1, 1, and then divide by 25 after I'm done. 
Uh, both of those are possibilities. So this mask will actually take the pixel and then replace it with an equally weighted value that is the, then applied to all its neighbors, which means that we will get the average of all the pixels in the 5 by 5 neighborhood. That's what that picture, what, that's what that mask will do. So the visual effect by, of taking a picture and then replacing it with the uh, average would be that differences between the pixels are going to be averaged out. So that means that edges are going to become softer. They're not going to be so strong anymore. Which means that the sharpness is going to be reduced. So your image is going to be blurred. So this will be a blurred mask. And we can see the result of applying that, those two filters onto an image. Now, if I only apply it once, it's visually a little bit hard to see, so I apply it five times in a row. And then we can now blur and sharpen images. So here's the input image, here's the blurred image, so you can see that the edges are much more fuzzy. And then I can sharpen the image again. Uh, that one I also would have to normalize the uh, average brightness of this uh, image here. But uh, the edges now become more crisp again here compared to here. So let's try some other images. And let's have a look at edge detection. So here's an input image from a temple in Taiwan. And <coughs> in the previous class, we talked about the fact that due to changes in brightness, it's very difficult to come up with color predicates that allow us to understand our world. Um, a lot of that needs to be, or would have to be, uh, based on uh, shapes. If you want to detect a shape, that means you need to find the outline of things. That means you need to find the edges of uh, in the image in order to construct outlines from that. Right. So. The first step at trying to do processing of shapes is always uh, to implement a edge detection algorithm or to detect edges in some form. And for humans, that's our visual system is very good at that. Um, we are able to detect shapes without any color or texture information. So, uh, oh, let's try that. Instead of looking for it on the internet, let's see if we can use Dali. Um, so 
this is a pretty unusual image. Um, Out of credits, of credits. Uh, wait. Um. Let's take Bing, which I think has which. So now can I that we could get something reasonable and then we convert it. Now you're supposed to create it. Enter your negative from here. Just
Okay, here's the Taiwan Black Bear. Not sure why it says riding a cannonball, but. Oh, no, no. Okay, um, I give up and let's take something. If you see something like that, then um, it's clear that these are our pictures of a fire truck, even though there's no texture and no colors involved. So a lot of processing going on in your brain to be able to match that. So we are able to identify shapes based on the outline of objects very efficiently, very accurately. Uh, now we will detect the shape even if the outlines are wrong. We don't have to match exactly uh, physical reality of the objects that, you look, that we're looking at. Um, that's how quite a few of the optical illusions can work. Right? As long as it's close enough, you won't be able to see any difference. Now, <laughs> if I want to extract the outline, then uh, we have to make the assumption that the object and the background, that there's some difference in, in brightness between those two. Some difference in color. Because otherwise, it would be impossible for much, much harder, like you can detect a rubber duck in most scenes very easily, right? But if it's a rubber duck in front of a, a field of sunflowers that are all yellow, then that makes it much, much harder. So, Assuming that there is some uh, difference between the background and the object, that means that we have an edge um, some difference in brightness values between the pixel and its neighbors. 
Now, you may say that actually the brightness value is not, uh, not necessary because I could have blue and then continue at the same brightness in red, in which case the grayscale image should look exactly the same. Uh, but your uh, color, your U value would be different. Um, that's theoretically possible in artificial images, but it never happens in, um, in natural scenes. If you take a picture of the actual world and uh, process it, if you have if your brain thinks that the red and the green are different, then you also have a difference in brightness usually. Also by what's captured in uh, your camera. So what we want to do is we want to take the edges and then extract them, uh, construct some outline of shapes from these edge pixels, the pixels that make up the edges. And here will be our input image. Now, how would we detect edges? Ideally, it's very easy, right? Because you would have, uh, in the ideal world, you have some image that goes along the rows. So here we're looking at one row of the image. And if there is an edge, you would see that the brightness value changes from 0 to 250. Then it stays constant going across here, and then we drop down. So in this particular picture, Along that row, we would identify two edges. The first edge would be here, and the second edge will be there. Here we're going from black to white, here we're going from white to black. But in reality, it's not quite so simple. One, the changes in difference are not going to be so pronounced. Right? So we may just go up by 20 of them. And also, our edges are usually not so crisp that we move from one pixel to the next pixel. Uh, the edge may be between two pixel locations. And um, there may be bleeding from your one CMOS cell into the neighboring CMOS cell. So usually uh, these extreme changes in brightness do not occur in the image that we get. So it's more likely that your edge is actually looking like that. Brightness will change over multiple pixels. But we still want to identify those as edges in our image. And then, of course, the entire image is distorted by brightness and other uh, influences, so you have noise added. And this is what you're dealing with in reality, then. So that makes it much harder to then identify exactly where the edge is. Because there are lots of changes here. Uh, this may be an edge, maybe an outlier. That pixel down here, or this one here. That may actually be an uh, edge from here to there. Or it may have uh, variations in brightness or some outlier. So that's what makes detecting edges non-trivial in our image. But there's a couple of things that we can
we can identify a couple of features in our image that we want our edge detection algorithm to be sensitive to. <coughs> now, when you read the description of edge detection in most textbooks or research papers, then um, and lots of other computer vision research, we are actually they are described, the algorithms are described <coughs> using mathematical notation. Um, now, mathematical notation, of course, is very terse. So it's, it, it compresses the, the algorithm into just a single line or two lines in order to describe a complex algorithm. But in order to actually implement it, unfortunately, that notation means that important features are often um, ignored or not described properly, which means that just given the equation, often you cannot implement the corresponding computer vision algorithm correctly. There's still lots of things about exactly how you calculate gradients or things like that. Um, but uh, from a mathematical point of view, the, most of the computer vision algorithms, when they describe their algorithm, they start by defining an image function, uh, x, y, that has two parameters, x and y, which is the uh, column and the row. And the image function then will return a value, which is the brightness of the pixel, at that particular location. So you get row and columns, and then the image function will return the brightness. Or it may be a multi-value function that returns multiple numbers, then uh, multi-value return function that you can have like red, green, and blue channels if it's a color piece. Now, this is already problematic because The problem is that if we describe this as a function, we can use uh, the terminology. We can use approaches, ideas from calculus in order to describe our computer vision. But the problem is, if we use calculus, then we need to talk about uh, derivatives and uh, integration, which are topics that most students don't like, um, because from high school we had to do, I guess, too many differentiations. The other thing is that our image function is not uh, sine x multiplied by uh, x divided by 3 or something like that. Right? There is no analytical form of, for our image function. Because the image function is a response of the CMOS sensor that you have in your camera or the CCE sensor that you have in your camera. So um, there's no analytical solution to any of this in a sense, but we simply get the output of our sensor. Now, we may have a function like that, right? along a single row. So let's say this is row 92. And that would be the image function. So then that would be i of x 92 or x from 0 to 100. This is a hundred pixels, something like that. But then again, uh, this already shows how the language of, or in my view, it shows how the language of functions is not really such a suitable language to describe images and processing of images. Um, because here, using this function, 
I could ask you what x is equal to 3.92 or something like that. Right? For every pixel here, I would expect a value to get a value. For every point there, I would expect to get a value. But in reality, I have some pixels, and there I can read the value. But any of the other numbers, I can't. I don't really know what is the brightness value of the uh, area halfway between two pixels, or one third one pixel, or two thirds the other pixel. I can make guesses, I can do interpolations, but I don't really have values for my function here somewhere. So this would be uh, x is an element of 0 to 100 for the integers or something like that. That's the only values that we get where we have a uh, image function. Everything else we're guessing. <coughs> So I think um, that actually using the language of algorithms and programs uh, is a better way to describe computer vision algorithms because often that makes concepts like the derivative of uh, the image function, for example, that then becomes a lot more intuitive a lot easier to understand what we're actually doing. So talking about the image function, if this is now i of x, then what would be the derivative of this function? So what would be i dash of x 92? Like if I just bury the index function sine y is equal to 92, which just gives me one row. Then I have a uh, single value function. Instead of a two parameter function, I only have a single parameter. So that makes uh, describing it a little bit easier. So if I talk about the derivative, of this, so here I have i of x, so now I want to talk about the derivative of i of x, i dash of x. What is that actually? If this has nothing to do with images, but it's some function f of x, and it looks like this, then what is f dash of x? Slope, right? So that means for every point here, I can assign a value, and that is the slope of the function at that point. So that would be the tangent there. Tangent to the line. And then there's lots of things we can do by calculating the first derivative. What do you usually do with it? In high school, when your teacher asks you to calculate the first derivative, then what would be the next question? Or why would you calculate the first derivative? Well, one of the most common uses for it would be to calculate the, to find the minimums and the maximums of a function. Because at the minimum or the maximum, your derivative, your first derivative should be zero, correct. 
So that means you analytically find the derivative of the function, then you set it to zero, you find where that um, derivative is zero, and then uh, those would be candidates for minimums or maximums. Then, in order to find out whether something is a minimum or a maximum, you would have to calculate the second derivative, right? Because if your second derivative is positive, then it's like driving, then this, this here would be um, positive, so then it would be a negative, uh, would be a minimum, and here would be a maximum. And by the way, when we talk about the second derivative, uh, what is that in the image? The first derivative is a slope, right? The second derivative would be the second derivative would be applying derivation to the first derivative, which means it's the slope of the slopes. So, uh, in other words, the slope tells you how much the function changes. Right? The bigger the slope, the more the function will change. The uh, second derivative tells you how much the uh, slope, which means the changes of the function, how much that changes. Then you can ask the third derivative and the fourth and the fifth, and you can keep going for, uh, until infinity, I guess, in principle. <coughs> now, the first derivative is usually our edge detection algorithms are described using the first derivative of the image function because we're looking for changes in the brightness. And the first derivative is calculating the changes in our image. But when the When the computer vision people talk about calculating the derivative of your image function, then uh, then it's not exactly specified how we do that. Because if I ask for the derivative at this point, I may not even have a pixel there. Right? So I will have to, and this is not an analytical function, so it's not like sine x where I can evaluate it at any x that I want, and I can uh, get back the value of the function. Here I can only get back the value of the function at certain positions. So in that case, for the derivative, we would be looking at the changes, which means according to the pixel. So I have a pixel x, x plus 1, and then I want to see how much that changes. And that's the simplest way of calculating the derivative. Now, you can be, you can, uh, you can be more clever about that. Um, Taylor expansion is have you heard of Taylor expansion? Taylor expansion is a way that if I'm given the value of a function at some point, then I can do make a pretty good guess about the value, what the values are <coughs> uh, close to that particular point. So that makes sense, right? Because in the image I have the value at x is equal to 3, but I don't have the value at x is equal to 3.01. Using Taylor expansion, 
I can do a better job estimating that. Um, so that's sometimes used, but the problem is when they describe the algorithm, they never tell you exactly how they calculate this derivative. They just say we calculate the derivative and mathematically that's a concept that exists, right? But on a computer you still have to get a number somehow. And often the performance of your algorithm actually depends quite a bit on how you do this calculation. And definitely the efficiency of the algorithm depends on how you do this calculation. So, um, but that, those details are completely ignored in the mathematical notation. So I will stick, I will include some mathematical notation here, but most of the description is all done using the Python code in order to give you a grounded understanding of what we're actually So an edge is defined as a big change in the image function, uh, the change of the value in calculus. Using calculus, that will be the first derivative. So in a sense, we want to calculate the first derivative um, of our image function. <coughs> so since we have a two-parameter function here, x and y, Right? I just fix y here so that I can draw it as a single function, but we usually have uh, x and y parameter, two parameters. That means for an image, we would be calculating the partial derivatives with respect to x and with respect to y. And of course, our problem is that we can only estimate this derivative. There's no analytical solution. The output of your camera sensor is not sine x squared multiplied by 7. The output of your camera sensor is whatever the camera is pointing to. Or pointing. So let's try and estimate the partial derivative for x, so along a row. Um, so that's equivalent to trying to detect an edge along a row in the image. And if we find an edge there, that means that we're detecting a vertical edge in the image. If I go along the row and I find this, then I have an edge pixel here. And the change is along the x-axis, which means the edge that I'm looking at would be a vertical line that would generate this kind of image. A horizontal line would not generate this kind of image. Horizontal line, if I just go across, will all be constant. There's no edge in the horizontal direction, only in the vertical direction. So we want to estimate the derivative. And the simplest way to estimate the derivative, of course, and the most efficient way, is to simply calculate the difference between my current pixel and the next pixel. So that will be calculating these changes here. From one pixel to the next, pixels here. Then I can calculate these um, changes in my image function and then I can say if that image function is above a certain threshold then uh, there is an edge and if it's below a certain threshold then it's not an edge. So then I may say that here I have an edge, and here I don't have edges. If my threshold is set like that. Now, 
this can actually be implemented as a convolution matrix because if I use this convolution mask, then the difference between my next pixel, my right neighbor, and myself would be the value of the right neighbor multiplied by 1 minus my own value. <coughs> and this is actually one of the first edge detection algorithms uh, that people implemented, that, that uh, were used. Uh, it's called the Roberts operator. And using this convolution mask, if I run it over the image, then I will get changes in the x direction that are very big. I will get a strong response. And if there's not much change, if it's a, uh, a rectangle or a horizontal line, then there won't be any response, and my uh, Robert operator is going to do, going to return a very low number, not going to have a strong response. Now, uh, this one is possible, but it's usually not calculated because, in a sense, it's too much bias onto my next neighbor here, and. The change here is over a very, uh, quite a small area, right? <coughs> so that means that any kind of noise is going to be amplified. Because in order to calculate that slope, I will take the delta y divided by delta x. Now, if delta y is noisy because I have uh, a physical sensor that includes noise, and then the smaller delta x is, the bigger the uh, impact of the noise is. The harder it will be to filter out the noise. So, a another approach is to simply take the right neighbor and the left neighbor and subtract those two, this one, subtract this one from this one. In that case, I get a symmetric filter, and it's a better estimate, so, because it will be a more stable estimate of the slope here, because I'm looking at the next neighbor in the picture behind. So the delta x is going to be twice as big. If there's some noise, then the influence of the noise is uh, reduced already. So that's uh, what's called the previous operator. Um, still noisy. Um, and in order to overcome that, then the idea is if we're looking for vertical edges, then I don't just I expect there to be multiple pixels above and below that, below that are all edges as well. So if I uh, do that convolution, instead of three just looking at a single row, I use three uh, rows. And then if all three of them say that there is a big change, then I'm much more likely to say that there's if it's a single one, and above there's no change, not a big change, below is not a big change, then probably this is not an edge pixel. Because it's uh, extremely unlikely that your feature is exactly one pixel at that right location in the image that, that never occurred. So uh, that gives us the previous horizontal operator. So those were all uh, early attempts at computer uh, edge detection algorithms that can be implemented very efficiently using convolution masks. And the one that is now in use and has sort of proven itself in, in thousands of different applications is the Sobel edge detector, <coughs> which is exactly like the premium 
edge detector, except So it's really just a, a variation, but instead of minus one, plus one here in the center row, I have minus two and plus two, and here, this is the vertical version of the Sobel edge detector. In that case, I have, um, I have taken the filter and just rotated it by 90 degrees. I end up uh, also previous would have a minus one and a plus one here. <coughs> so the reason for the Sobel edge detector compared to the previous edge detector, the only difference is that we put more weight on the currently the role that we're currently processing. Right in previous. It's one, 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 so the weight is equal, which means uh, the final output is going to be 33% the row above, 33% your own row, 33% the row below. Right? By using the Sobel edge detector, we change that weighting because now the top row is going to be how many percent of the final output? 25%, that's right. Uh, so we have 25% on the top, 50% in our center row, and 25% on the bottom. And so those are the most common edge detection algorithms. Uh, more powerful, more expanded, uh, more Complex algorithms like the Canny edge detector, um, they are based on the Sobel edge detector. The first pass that they run is usually a Sobel edge detector first, then they apply some additional um, processing steps. So let's see how that works. Uh, another thing that we can do is that people have uh, proposed in the literature is with the edge detection mask, with convolution mask, it's clear that I can find edges that are horizontal, uh, that are vertical or horizontal, right, by using the two Sobel edge detectors. Um, but I can also rotate the mask by 45 degrees, and then I would end up with this kind of mask. Right, minus one zero one, minus two zero two, minus one zero one, slanted forty five degrees. So in that case, I will get a forty five degree up uh, edge detection mask that, that I can use. Or I can also rotate it uh, forty five degrees the other way, and it will be going downwards. So in total, I can have eight different masks. Uh, those are called Hirsch masks. But for most applications nowadays, uh, people we just process, we just calculate the horizontal Sobel and the vertical Sobel and none of the other uh, 45 degree mask. That's sufficient to estimate the gradient of the pixel in the image because then we get the change in the x direction, the change in the y direction. Based on that, we can calculate the angle of the edge. Here are some convolution masks. Here is the Kirsch mask on that image of the temple in Taiwan. And you can see the response of the operator. Uh, here, for example, we have strong 45 degree angle response. Um, on these, the, we also get some response, strong response here. Part of the um, dragon head there. So actually, Um, 
So he has the convolution out of uh, the Kirsch mask. Now what I could do is make that green. So I can just threshold the image now. So I set it thre threshold. Now the output of my convolution with the Kirsch mask is image two. Image four, sorry, the output of my Kirsch mask. Maybe I get image two. This image four. So I take the maximum. Uh, first, I take the absolute of image four because uh, the filter response could be negative or positive depending on if I go from black to white or from white to black. Right? The slope is going to be positive or negative. Now, usually. If we look for strong edges, I don't care about whether it's white to black or black to white, which means I just take the absolute of the response of the filter. And then um, I want to have a threshold. Now I want it to be adapted. Otherwise, I have to find one by hand every time. So let's pick the maximum of our image. So this is the strongest edge pixel that I have in the image. And then I want to set my threshold at 0 0.9 times that. So that's like 10% of the maximum threshold. Now we can see how many pixels that is. If it's less than or equal to threshold, actually, uh, I can do that in a single NumPy array. So if it's greater than or equal to the threshold, then I set it to 1, otherwise I set it to 0. Then I plot number five. Uh, okay. 
this is because it's um, an integer data type, so I need to set it to 255 instead of Seven hundred and ninety seven. Uh, it's,
And he has a fierce output. But the fresh holding is working, it just generates the wrong uh, grayscale map. Okay. So now we can have the output of the version. Before it was too too few pixels to be shown here. <coughs> and then I can apply the social edge detector and the curse in the three directions. Two directions, and here would be the outputs of strong responses by total in the x direction. So here we see horizontal lines, here we see vertical lines, 
here they're sloping upwards and here they're sloping downwards. But usually we only use sobo x and y. Um, in order to calculate, estimate the gradient of the pixel, uh, that's usually good enough. Okay, good. Then that's it for today. And I will see you all next week. And I suggest you start thinking about the assignment, see what you want to implement for your magic trick. Thank you.